Welcome everyone to the special Crow Diaspora webinar about Operation Storm, the decisive battle of the Croatian War for Independence. On this day, 25 years ago, Croatian history would be forever changed. A military operation that is studied by military generals and armies around the world took place in the hinterland of Croatia. Operation Storm liberated occupied Croatian territory by the Serb and JNA forces and is celebrated on the 5th of August as the end of the Croatian War for Independence. I want to begin by thanking our guests, Anna Katalinic, who we're going to hear from just, just shortly, Defense Case Manager for General Gotovina, and Tomislav Kuzmanovic, who is in a secret location somewhere. Uh, he's the <laughs> Defense Attorney for General Markac. We're and taking time the, to prepare the, for our webinar attorneys. today. One of the defense attorneys, yeah. yeah. Uh, due to the events proceeding uh, after Operation Storm, Generals Gotovina and Markac were extradited to The Hague. During the ICTY appeal, our guests defended Generals Gotovina and Markac and ult ultimately demonstrated why Oluya was the pinnacle of ending the war in Croatia. Another important issue that we'll be not focusing on in this webinar is the reasons why the Serbian population during Operation Storm left. I encourage you to watch Luka Mishetic's uh, webinar on this topic in the comments below. I'll put a link in the, book, in the comments below. Be sure to ask your questions as we'll have time for a couple questions towards the end, but I'm 100% I'm sure that they'll probably be answered in this really, uh, really descriptive presentation. And uh, yeah, so I'll give it off to Anna Katalinic. I'm just going to turn around the laptop now. Boop, boop. We've got a sophisticated IT group helping here, so <laughs> thanks. <Exactly. Martin>. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everyone. So here, I'm just going to go down. Uh, so here we are on the eve of Operation Storm of celebrating the 25th anniversary. Um, so if we think that 10,000 square kilometers of Croatia was liberated. That's about 18% of Croatia's territory. Uh, liberated in a lawful operation from the rebel Krajina Serbs, uh, the operation marked the end of the war in Croatia and carved a significant point in Croatian history. So in today's webinar, we're going to discuss the legal outcome of the trial and the appeal in The Hague. And, and we're going to try in the most easiest way to explain um, why, how and why the appeals chamber deemed that Operation Storm uh, was actually deemed uh, a lawful military operation. As Mate mentioned just a second ago, um, Luka Mishutic has prepared a separate video, which is incredibly informative and speaks of the, the, the second um, important factor of, of what the Croatian generals were charged with. And that was um, the, the alleged and then proven um, unfounded deportation of Serbs from the Krajina region. So uh, Mate is going to provide a link to that uh, video presentation and you can um, take the time to view it uh, when you have an opportunity. I strongly recommend it for anyone who wants to better understand exactly what happened during storm. Um, there have been a lot of military and legal um, academic articles written about storm. The material is technical. Um, it, uh, it's, 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 quite, um, it, it's quite a heavy read. And um, what we want to do is try and explain it in, a, in the, the trial and appeal in the most basic language so that more of us can better understand uh, the reasoning of the appeal outcome. We're looking at who was once considered uh, the accused persons, uh, the generals at the tribunal, Ante Gotovina, Martin Markac, and Ivan Cermak. Uh, Ante Gotovina was indicted first, and after the reckless indictment uh, was brought against him in 2001, uh, General Gotovina became a fugitive. Uh, he didn't want to volunteer, uh, volunteer uh, or surrender himself. Uh, and he was a fugitive for four years. 
in 2005, he was uh, arrested in Spain. And after a period of a, a pretrial period of two and a half years, trial and appeal that lasted about four years, um, General Gotovina last, he was in detention for seven years be before being found absolutely not guilty. Uh, Generals Markac and Chermak were indicted in 2004. They surrendered voluntarily. And it was uh, Croatia's Minister of Justice, uh, Vesna Shkare Ozbold at the time said that very positively, the Croatian government believed that um, Generals Markac and Chermak would uh, prove their innocence uh, without, without a problem. It, it became quite an undertaking, but eventually it was true. They, they were uh, proven innocent. Uh, today, the legacies of General Gotovina, Cermak, and Markac uh, stand strong. Uh, General Gotovina's military and strategic acumen deserves every Croatian citizen's gratitude. And, and we can't uh, stress enough how important it is that the historical narrative of Operation Storm uh, show that it was indeed a lawful military victory. As General Gotovina himself said the day that he was acquitted and when he came back to Zagreb, he said we had a military storm <clears throat> and the, the, the appeal outcome was our legal storm. Um, I'm going to uh, go to the next slide now. Tom, would you like to take over now? Sure, thank you, Anna. Um, first, I'd like to thank Crow Diaspora for putting this together and for asking me to participate and Anna. Um, I was one of the counsel for General Markac, uh, not getting involved in the case until uh, November of 2007, barely uh, three or four months before the trial began. So I had a lot of work to do myself to catch up. Um, but as you may or may not know during the course of the trial, um, and even before, we worked together, uh, the defendants. We didn't point fingers. Uh, we knew we had uh, an excellent defense. And um, you know, I'd like to thank, obviously, lead counsel for me, Goran Mikulicic, Vlad Lorendlic, who was my case, our case manager, and all the guys and gals on our team. And of course, uh, you know, Luka Mishetic, uh, Greg Kehoe, Payam Akavan, um, all, the, all the people who were involved, Diana, uh, obviously in Anna. Diana, yeah, yeah, Sean um, and- uh, Sean and Mike. Uh, Mike, anyway, um, we, we know who they are. You should know who they are, but we work together very hard. Um, let's just take a look at this map that's on the screen. This shows you the situation Croatia was in from a military standpoint in early 1995. The far right sector is called Sector East. That's where Vukovar was. Um, you've got UN Sector West, which was uh, retaken by Croatia in uh, Operacija Bljesak in May of 1995, uh, effectively eliminating that part <clears throat> uh, of control from uh, both uh, Serb control and obviously the UN, uh, which allowed free travel essentially east and west in the northern part of Croatia. Uh, obviously you can see sectors north and south uh, cutting Croatia essentially in half uh, from north to south. And given the military situation that occurred and was occurring in the summer of 1995, uh, it was do or die. Uh, either there was gonna be a, a negotiated settlement uh, which the Serb uh, government there consistently uh, and wholeheartedly rejected at every opportunity that President Tuđman had offered, uh, or it was going to be taken back militarily, at which time every single Western country and the Russians were claiming you'd never be able to do it, you can't do it, uh, you're going to lose, it's going to make things worse, etc. Let's look at the perspective from before we get to the next slide of what, where we were as a whole in, on that territory. Srebrenica had just occurred in early July of 95, which was a small town on the border, near the border of uh, Serbia and Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, we all know what happened there. Bihać uh, could have even been a worse disaster. And you can see Bihać. It was also a UN protected area, uh, almost completely, well, it was completely surrounded by 
uh, the Serb forces and the JNA. The hatch was close to falling at the time Operation Storm uh, was undertaken, uh, starting today and uh, tomorrow. So what we need to do uh, is look at the situation of what could have happened had Croatia not undertaken Operation Storm. Bihać could have been uh, a much worse Srebrenica. Uh, Croatia would not have uh, free access and to its own internationally recognized borders and control over that. Uh, so President Tujman undertook and made the decision along with his advisors uh, and military officials to, to undertake Oluya and thank God that they did. Um, if you look at the uh, UN sectors north and south, the indictment area for our three uh, clients was UN sector south and Kanin being the center of gravity for the Serb forces, General uh, Gotovina uh, and others, their, the brilliant plan was to cut it off at its head, which essentially is what happened. Uh, my client's forces were in the Velabit Mountains stationed there and their job was really to split north and south in half uh, and not allow any reinforcement from any, uh, any way, either north or south. If you look at the next map, uh, if you can move that, please. Uh, uh, this this is the next map that you wanted to look at. Yeah, the next map is um, these. These two maps were from the uh, prosecution's packet of maps, which they presented to us at the beginning of the case. Some of them obviously were very beneficial. Some of them were junk. Um, this one showed essentially a, a pretty good detail, and it's hard to read because it's a little smaller on your screens. But this was essentially Operation Storm in its full effect. Um, showing how the operation was undertaken from its beginning and the vast amount of territory that was involved uh, and the vast amount of coordination that needed to take place. Uh, if not for uh, General Gotovina's uh, move up the uh, spine of Bosnia and Herzegovina on the border uh, in taking places like Bosansko Grahovo uh, and uh, taking over the Dinara, this couldn't have happened. So um, those operations with the consent and assistance of the Bosnian uh, uh, army uh, were enabled Croatia under the split agreement between Croatia and Bosnia and Herzegovina for Croatian forces and HVO to operate inside of Bosnia in an attempt to uh, uh, come at Kanin from behind, uh, which eventually happened. So these maps, uh, while uh, informative, don't tell necessarily the whole story. Um, if we could go to the next uh, dot, uh, slide. The next slide is uh, Prosecution Exhibit 401. What's interesting about this exhibit is the UN obviously had reporting capabilities and forces uh, and uh, intelligence on the ground. Um, this was a report written by Canadian General Ferran, who was the chief of UN Sector South, uh, and they had their headquarters in Kneen. Uh, what's interesting about this is it, it describes fairly well uh, what the Croatian military did during the course of before and during the operation. If you look at this report, uh, it says operations in Bosnia, HV operations, and it should be HV, HVO to be accurate, leading to the capture of Grahovo and Glamoc should have unnerved the Serbs. It clearly did, he just didn't, wasn't smart enough to know that. Um, it was a brilliant strategic move, which is credit to General Gotovina, and this is the Canadian general talking, uh, as it opened up additional avenues of approaches and the capture of Grahovo by the HV closed the best and most direct resupply road from Kneen to Belgrade. Um, what was interesting is if you look further down on that slide, uh, on the RSK side, their continuous hard line taken toward negotiations and the ARSK support of the Bosnian Serb offensive against Bihać from sector north were pointless actions that only contributed to the sense of hopelessness in the Krajina. These actions also played into the hands of the Croats by giving them a valid argument for the military option. Well, I would think that another Srebrenica was a valid option, uh, preventing another Srebrenica. Um, today, and as General Ferran writes, today it is hard to understand the reasoning by those who ordered these actions. He's talking about the Serbs. Or did not take the appropriate measures in reaction to the uh, evolving threat. Uh, and then, of course, he goes into the uh, conspiracy theories hard, here hard. There must be some unknown factors or deals here, as if 
as if uh, trying to liberate your own country from a military standpoint involves some kind of a deal. Um, if you look at the next slide of P401, <clears throat> excuse me, um, this is very true, I think, his first line here. I truly believe that by the eve of the war, the Kraina had already been psychologically defeated. Um, and of course, again, he gives no credit to the Croatian military or, or government here. I am not a proponent of the certain propaganda line that the HV are now a powerful professional military force. Most of their attacks were uncoordinated and went nowhere. Well, I, I would hardly call uh, reconquering a third of your territory going nowhere. Um, it is obvious that they have, uh, it was not obvious they had mastered the tactics of the interaction of combat arms. Uh, their use of artillery was excellent, which is ironic given the whole indictment was based on the uh, alleged illegal use of artillery. But the coordination between artillery tanks and infantry was not evident. So I don't think that's true based on what happened. If we go down to the, the not the next slide because it's all blacked out, um, but the slide after that. Um, and we're talking military operations here that you need to know about because these were facts that were presented at trial uh, and, and what was most distressing to all of us is we believe we had more than enough information at trial for them to be acquitted then, but that's another story. Um, the first uh, successful penetration, penetration in the South by an uh, HV tank company when they came over the Dinara Mountains from Bosnia. Of course, this is General Gotovina's uh, uh, HV uh, during the course of the first days of Operation Storm. Um, and I got to give a credit to some of my boys, the speciality here later in this page. Um, the other HV success with the key, was the key action in the HV campaign in sector south in the Velibit Mountains at Mali Allen. Now, of course, he calls speciality the uh, Special Forces uh, HV. Well, they were connected, obviously, with the, for, with the HV, but they were not HV. They were a separate uh, entity. Uh, we knew from Jorbat, which is the Jordanian b battalion stationed right, right outside of Gracats, and UNMO reports, it's the uh, United uh, Nations, uh, Anna chime in here, I can't remember what M stands for. Um, whatever. Sorry, the... Uh, it's a UN, yeah, the UNMO, uh, those were reports by U uh, UN, United Nations military observers, that's on Military so. observers. Mm -hmm. um, that HB uh, special police battalions had been training and operating in the Velibits for like three years they were up there, um, not just for months. And then these men supported by heavy artillery took Mali Allen, which is a key crossing in the Velibit mountains. Uh, and then through the Velibits along that road went down toward Lovinac and Sveti Rok, you know where the, where the tunnel now is, the longest tunnel in Croatia, the Sveti Rok tunnel, that's exactly in that area where this uh, breakthrough occurred by the uh, speciality. Um, and what was amazing was that they did most of this on foot. Um, and, you know, he's amazed here, he says, uh, seems to be, a, be ha, ha, seems to have been given to the HV by the ARSK without, with almost no fighting. Well, how about uh, giving the guys who were on the ground uh, shooting and dying a little credit? They did a hell of a job, uh, the speciality and splitting that area in two. Um, why don't we go to the next slide? Um, and Anna, feel free to chime in here. I've been talking for a while. Um, Keep going. You, uh, actually Keep going. I'll, I'll chime in in a bit. Right. <laughs> let's get past. Right. Let's get past P four. All right. Four hundred one. Okay, we're done with P four hundred one, and we'll go to the next slide, which is the critics of Operation Storm, what they often fail to mention. Um, you right. Know, Anna, did, Anna did a nice job of, of putting together sort of the synopsis of this. So go ahead, Anna. Um, well, as as time progresses from, you know, from when when the uh, when the war was taking place to the time of, of the trial, the indict the indictments, the trial, the appeal, and then here we are today, the year 2020. And um, you still hear criticisms of Operation Storm, despite the fact that it's been, you know, celebrated as, as a military victory. It's it's justified. It was soundly carried out, and yet 
uh, when you look at a lot of the criticisms, whether it, it, it's worrisome that you see a lot of academic works that, you know, I, I was looking at some things at the Utrecht, at Utrecht University and, you know, journalists, I don't know, it was recent, 2013, you know, you'll look at descriptions of what happened in Operation Storm, but they don't mention a period between 1990 one in 1995. So they won't mention the atrocities by the army of the Republika Srpska Krajina. Uh, they failed to mention that the members of the RSK leadership were tried for war crimes by the ICTY. Uh, Milan Martic was sentenced to 35 years. Milan Babic, uh, he made a plea bargain. He became a friend of the prosecution, uh, but the uh, the weight of 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 the, you know the events and and the crimes that he was charged and convicted of uh, consumed him. He ended up killing himself while he was in detention, and I think that was in the middle when he was testifying. I'm gonna in the book of in the uh, I can't remember which case it was in the middle of, of when he was testifying in one of the cases. Um, Goran Hajic, uh, he was uh, indicted, uh, however, he died before uh, his trial ended. Um, the critics won't bring uh, the media's attention to those events. Um, they don't mention that uh, there was an ethnic cleansing campaign in the Republika Srpska Krajina where virtually every non-Serb uh, member of the population was forcibly removed deported or killed uh, between 91 and 95. Um, and, and what's very significant is that um, there was a joint criminal enterprise found to exist in the RSK. Um, and this ethnic cleansing of, of non-Serbs occurred on a large scale. You know, if you're gonna cr criticize Operation Storm, then, you know, why don't you look at the overall picture of what happened and why and keep, you know, the chronology and, and the cause and effect uh, in the story, in your narrative, instead of just conveniently skipping over it. You know, I, I think, uh, and, and contrast that and the presentation, written presentation made in P401 uh, by General Ferran and the next slide, two slides, which was a uh, basically a release from the U.S. Defense Department in, on July 12th of 2017 by then Secretary, Defense Secretary Mattis, in honor of uh, Defense Minister uh, Krstičević, who obviously was one of the key participants in Operation Storm uh, to the Pentagon, where the Secretary is praising not just um, Minister Krstičević for coming to uh, Arlington and paying his respects, but also saying here on the second, on slide 14, 22 years ago next month marks the anniversary of an operation named Storm, an operation that is studied in the US military to show what a well-led force, well-trained, well-equipped, and with good political guidance, how it can change the course of history. Uh, we have great respect here for our friend and ally. It's a small country, but I would just say that it, as we say, bats above its weight fights above its weight. <clears throat> I mean, I, what, more, what bigger compliment can you have than a commander who, who commanded forces in Afghanistan and Iraq for the American military and as the Secretary of Defense to say something like that about Operation Storm? Um, and, and thanking Croatia for its contributions from Kosovo to Afghanistan, we're proud to serve shoulder to shoulder with you and your troops. It is a pleasure to have you here because of the values you represent, the contribution to peace and stability is so different from some of the issues I've dealt with like North Korea, which is at exactly the opposite. I mean, not all good ideas come from the nation with the most aircraft carriers. What a great line. Um, so I, yeah. I think it's, it's, it's very wonderful to have that. And of course, I only found that just out of sheer luck doing some research to update my, um, my uh, PowerPoint, because I, I have given these on my own over the years to both law schools and at conferences. And when I found that, I said, how fitting for, for that to, to fit within the narrative to show uh, how uh, wrongly many in the Western world show Operation Storm. Now, yep. if we go to the next slide, yep. number 15, go ahead, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm, I'm agreeing, and um, it's 
it's good to point out, um, as as Mattis uh, more recently did in the state uh, in the in the U.S. Um, to, to you know to thank and and welcome General Krasicevich. Um, if we look back during the appeal, I mean, um, it was interesting to see that that military experts are really turned a very concerned eye. Uh, to to the outcome of the of the trial de- judgment, and then um, you know when you look at the targeting decisions that occurred uh, during Operation Storm were so complex. Um, it, it was it was concerning that the trial chamber decision was so poorly and unreasonably constructed. And uh, Tom, you'll remember that when the twelve military experts, so they were from around the world, but on their own collective initiative. They submitted an application to the appeals chamber um, and offered to become uh, amicus, uh, friends of the court, for the sole purpose of providing the appeals chamber their insight on, um, on, on things that need to be considered and, and, and to be made aware of with respect to military and international humanitarian law. Um, I, at the time when that application was made, I, I was quite surprised that one of the experts was actually a former senior legal advisor in the ICTY prosecutor's office. So when you have a member of the, a former member of the prosecution um, making an application like that, uh, that was quite an eye opener on you know how gravely wrong um, the trial chamber decision was. Uh, the, the appeals chamber didn't employ um, the 12 experts as, as friends of the court, uh, but they didn't have to because it was quite obvious that, um, that the trial chamber decision was, was gravely wrong. And obviously, Anna, the plus to that so was it Tom, was filed. It, yeah, it, it was filed as a request for amicus, but they filed their brief along with their request. So, you know, it was read even though it wasn't accepted as an amicus. Uh, so that it was a big plus for us. It was read, so you, 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 you can almost expect that it was taken into consideration. Yeah, at least I'm willing right. to believe it was. Um, so Tom, do you, want to, do you want to start commenting on, on uh, the background? Sure, I think we talked a little bit. We can probably skip slide 16. We, okay. Anna talked about that. A period of 91 to 95 and how most of the Croatian population was expelled uh, from areas of sector north and south. We, the next slide 17 really goes into the specific crimes alleged. <laughs> Excuse me. I don't have coronavirus, just so you know. Um, the accused were responsible for having planned, instigated, ordered, or aided it or abetted, you know, a litany of crimes, everything under the sun. I mean, that's how these indictments are written. It's the sh- what, what we in the U.S. call a shotgun approach, throw everything up against the wall and, and see what gets hit or see what sticks. Um, yeah. So you can see the, yeah. broad, the broad nature of the indictment and how every single part of that indictment, whether it was um, meritless or whether there was arguably merit to it, had to be defended. Um, and that yeah. is probably yeah. one of the reasons why the trial went so long is because the broad nature of the indictment uh, necessitated that kind of a defense. Um, we weren't going to cave right. on any single issue. That was our position. Every, every witness, every question, every issue is going to be fought tooth and nail because we're not going to concede anything. And, um, right. and that was our right to do, uh, both legally, morally, and uh, for our clients. Absolutely. Um, I, I thought it was. I thought it would be uh, worth explaining um, just some elements to consider when you when you consider you know why was this indictment brought forward and there were a lot of um, influential factors uh, that that existed and the first one let's be honest Carla Del Ponte uh, the chief prosecutor at the time uh, wanted all sides to be guilty and. Um, this has been discussed, I think, in, in, in many avenues. So I think it's fair to say that 
um, you know, despite the obvious that the Serbs were, were responsible for the, the most of the crimes that occurred during uh, the conflicts in the former Yugoslavia, uh, uh, Carla Del Ponte made, you know, I think there was an understanding she had with Belgrade. And uh, what they expected in return was for her office to show that not only the Serbs were the bad guys. And, uh, and in, in, the, in the early 2000s, you know, this slew of indictments uh, were, were, were prepared. Um, you know, uh, a, a lot of uh, the Bosniaks, uh, Kosovar Albanians, um, there were Macedonians uh, indicted. I, I, you know, and then people were saying the war touched, you know, Macedonia. But, you know, and, and a lot of these uh, indictments, if you, if you look at how they were treated on trial and then at appeal, well, they flopped. Um, most of the indictees were found not guilty. You know, and I can't help but wonder uh, what uh, the ICTY investigators, uh, the analysts, uh, the researchers, what were they providing? Uh, what kind of information were they providing to the prosecutor um, and her team of experts to actually uh, prepare such uh, such documents, such indictments, and to and to get um, a judge uh, to 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 look at this and to consider this, but it did. It, it happened. Uh, the another Big thing to to consider is um, no, no, go ahead. Okay, um, what was behind? behind uh, the indictment uh, as well is the artillery attacks. The prosecution, you know, they, they found, okay, we're gonna find, we're gonna establish that there was an evil plan that, uh, that made the Serbs flee. And, and we're going to, cho to show that there was a joint criminal enterprise. And, and we'll get into uh, explaining more about that. Uh, basing this, this evil plan, this joint criminal enterprise on, on a meeting that, that was held, uh, by the Croatian leadership and the military uh, just before Operation Storm was carried out. Uh, that, that was uh, a, a triggering, oh, well, that was one of the, uh, the important things that they based their indictment on. Um, but the, 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 the news at the time, what, what people were saying, like uh, people like Carl Bildt, who actually wanted to accuse President Tuđman of war crimes because of uh, Operation Storm having taken place? Um, you know, he bellowed uh, this at, at the time, and you know, if you look today, uh, his 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 comments uh, are were perfectly groundless, and uh, you know, as a result of comments like that, for for quite a while, he was considered a persona non grata in Croatia. Uh, so, so those are some elements to consider. Um, Tom, do you want to, go to get into we, yeah, about sure. how the generals? Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, we can go to the next slide um, uh, about sort of how, how they try to characterize this from a legal standpoint. Um, do you want the you next need one? To also know the next slide. Yeah, the eight, uh, nineteen. The mm -hmm. word that starts the three accused were tried. Um, I think the one thing you have to also understand is, is Carla Del Ponte made this personal, especially with General Gatovina. I mean, she was livid that he uh, would not voluntarily uh, turn himself in. Uh, I mean, they, she made wild accusations against the Catholic Church in Croatia for hiding him. And I, I got a great anecdote, which is true, uh, about uh, him supposedly hiding on the Croatian island of Visovac, where there's a Franciscan uh, monastery. I don't know if you, any of you have been there, but it's absolutely gorgeous. The story goes like this. I happen to be in Rome working on another matter on behalf of the Franciscan order of priests that's venued in the United States. The uh, Franciscan order is run by uh, a, a board of defectors, they're called definitors. The definitor, one of the definitors from Croatia was a, a priest from Visovac. And he, he, um, he passed away a couple of years ago, just a wonderful man. So here I am in, in Rome talking to him about this 
you know, we obviously start talking about um, this case and this is yeah, actually even before I was involved. <clears throat> and he says, you know, I wrote a letter strongly objecting to Carla Del Ponte's uh, accusation that we were hiding uh, General Gotovina, even, even if, uh, uh, you know, we would have been happy to do so, you know, um, because she accused him of hiding him specifically and the Franciscans of hiding General Gotovina on Visalas. How did this come about? Well, at the same time as General Gotovina was, uh, was not turning himself in under the circumstances, the Franciscan orders elected their next general, who is the general of the order. The general is the leader of the entire Franciscan order in the world. They were, so there was a phone call that comes into Visovats from Rome. And the new general is going to come and visit the various orders, especially in Europe after his election. And this uh, new general happened to be, uh, I think he was from Colombia. And so the phone call comes in to Visovats from Rome and they're talking and, and the, uh, the uh, person on the phone in Rome is, is telling the people in Visovats General Dolazi, General Dolazi, Molivas Pulipirimitese, which means the general is coming, the general is coming, please get things ready. Of course, that transcript is intercepted, given to Carla Del Ponte. She makes the accusation that the general is coming to Visovats. I mean, that's the extent of which they went to try to find General Gotovina by listening to phone conversation of Franciscan priests talking about not General Gotovina, but the general of the order. That's how insane it got. Uh, and that's how personal it got with, with uh, Carlos de Ponte. And of course, uh, the general of the order, including uh, the uh, definitor, um, uh, Father Shima, now I remember his name, Father Shima Sushats, um, the late Father Shima Sushats, never got an apology. So I know that I digressed a bit there, but that's how personal it got. And um, it ended up being a true story because a member of our defense team uh, who worked in the Croatian intelligence services uh, ended up corroborating everything that I, that the, the uh, uh, Croatian priest told me. So anyway, let's get back to the facts. Um, from a legal standpoint, as you can see on the screen, you've probably read this while I was blabbing on, but this is the legal method by which they tried to uh, convict uh, all three generals. And as I said, it was very broad. The joint criminal enterprise theory was the uh, main methodology of trying to convict the generals. Interestingly enough, uh, we at least as a Markash defense team were, were initially more worried about the uh, superior responsibility, command responsibility doctrine. Um, although um, the joint criminal enterprise in some ways uh, quote easier end quote to try to convict someone because uh, it was judicially created in The Hague and by the prosecution uh, in other cases. However, um, it got to the point where the prosecution alleged that, let's say General Gotovina, and General Markach, whomever, didn't even know personally cr have pr criminal liability. Uh, it was because these acts were foreseeable and a natural consequence of the joint criminal enterprise that they could be found guilty. So. I mean, it was on every possible level that uh, you could be tried on these cases in, in, in an attempt to find you guilty. Uh, if we could go to the next slide. And now Anna and uh, I and all of us in the defense team, I mean, 303 trial days, that's a hell of a lot. Um, and it's because all the defense counsel and all the defendants uh, put up strong defenses. We just didn't say, okay, you're done with your case, we're gonna to move to a quit and we're not gonna put on a defense. We said, no way. This is our chance to put on our defense and show what the facts are, which is what we did. Um, you know, that's a lot of witnesses and you gotta remember, this is in, most of these witnesses are testifying in Croatian or Serbian. Everything has to be translated. We all have to listen closely to make sure things aren't incorrectly translated. Um, I mean, it was an ordeal. Uh, so, I mean, it was a, it was a, it was a marathon, not a sprint. Um, if we could go to the next slide, the 21. The, the trial chamber in its decision framed their judgment as a case about whether Serb civilians and their property were the targets of crimes 
and whether the accused should be criminally responsible for those crimes. Um, we talked about what, what's going on in like slide 22. Uh, General Chermock was not uh, involved in Operation Storm at all, but he was named the military garrison commander in Canine, where a lot of the bad stuff happened after Operation Storm or in that area. Um, so he was uh, accused of being responsible for what happened afterwards in many instances, along with Gotovid and Markach. Um, now, I'll let Anna talk about, she put this slide together, it was very well done, about what did not occur in Operation Storm. So go ahead, Anna. 23, I think, is the slide. Yeah, I thought it was um, definitely uh, worth uh, explaining uh, what did and what didn't occur in Operation Storm. And, and I think we can certainly say what didn't occur. Um, blatant indiscriminate attacks on civilian population centers did not happen in storm. That's what happened in Sarajevo, you know, when the Bosnian Serbs uh, held Sarajevo under siege for three years. Um, Operation Storm didn't involve executions of assembled civilians. No, that's what the Bosnian Serbs did in Srebrenica. Uh, Operation Storm uh, was not an exercise where Croatia was trying to conquer um, another country's territory. Operation Storm uh, didn't involve acts of ethnic cleansing. Uh, and the Croatian army, uh, unlike uh, the Bosnian Serbs and, 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 and Serbs in Croatia, did not deport or force Serbs out of the Krajina. And we'll get into that a little later as well. Uh, and, and again, as I mentioned, Luca's uh, presentation very well uh, explains and uh, explains the reasoning and how and why uh, the Ukraina Serbs left on their own. What did happen in Operation Storm? It was a complex military endeavor and the, com the, the Croatian army uh, Basically, after after several years of, of uh, you know thirty percent of its territory being uh, seized from them, they recaptured it uh, from the rebel Serbs. Uh, the Croatian army had a very complex task of targeting uh, military positions uh, from the army of the Republika Srpska Krajina, and and focusing only on them. Uh, many of these targets were, were, were positioned in civilian areas. So um, th that, that was very, a very complex exercise in, in focusing and zooming in on these targets. Um, and, the, and part of that was to take strict measures and, and not harm Serb civilian, <coughs> civilians or property. Um, a very uh, important outcome of Operation Storm was that uh, the Muslim population in Bihać uh, enclave in Bosnia and Herzegovina was spared. Uh, it didn't uh, meet the same fate that Srebrenica had suffered only a couple of weeks earlier. Um, I think there's a huge uh, deal of gratitude, uh, just um, from a humanitarian aspect. On, on why Operation Storm was, was such a success. Um, the next slide, we'll, Tom, if you want to explain um, how they were, oh, I think we lost Tom momentarily. I think he'll come back on in oh. a second. Yep. Are you I'm there? Back. Okay, okay. Go ahead, Tom. I think, uh, okay, uh, if you look at slide um, 25, which talks about yes. um, the trial chamber's uh, considerations uh, in its decision, they essentially said that the meeting at Bruni was the hatching of the joint criminal enterprise, which mm -hmm. happened a few days or a week or so before Operation Storm. Uh, and the context, the statements, uh, during that meeting made by various participants uh, in that context was their idea of how a um, joint criminal enterprise would take place. So the Brioni transcript, at least to the trial chamber, 
was key, even though we thoroughly demonstrated that that <clears throat> when you take the Brioni uh, transcript as a whole, not slicing out specific statements or lines, that that couldn't be the case. Um, if you look at the next slide, 26, what was interesting was, well, yeah, you had a joint criminal enterprise, but you know the common objective that you had didn't amount or involve the commission of crimes uh, on that list in that first bullet point. Um, the, the general basis for their joint criminal enterprise uh, conviction was that the two generals, meaning Gotovin and Markach, were I think we're having just a little bit of trouble with uh, Tom's connection. Yeah. There we go. I'm back. Um, as I was saying, that the back. basis of their JCE was artillery, that the artillery attack that began Operation Storm was an unlawful attack on civilians and civilian options, and that that was what led people to leave. And then because of them leaving, we made no effort to prevent the follow-up crimes that were committed by subordinates or alleged to have been committed. Um, but they were natural and joint foreseeable consequences of the artillery attack. So when you look at it from that standpoint, their logic was because of the artillery, that's why people left and the artillery was targeted at civilians. And that was the way it goes. I'm back. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. I don't know what's happening, but I'm fading in and out occasionally. That's okay. Um, if, if you look at the next slide, 27, General Chermock was not a member of the Joint Criminal Enterprise because he wasn't at the leadership meeting, number one, and he didn't show up until after mm -hmm. everything was over. So that he was he was acquitted. So if you look at the next slide, 28, um, you know, those are some pretty heavy duty sentences. You know, everybody was happy, obviously, yeah. for General Chermock that he was acquitted. Um, but the next war from our standpoint after the trial was the appeal. Um, yeah. And the slide 29 talks about how did, the, how did the trial chamber find the Croatian army guilty of unlawful artillery attacks? Um, if you look at the, at the slide number 30, and Anna, go ahead, um, you put these slides together, you did a great job of that, uh, explaining it. Um, we talk about the um, target. So. I, it's, um, this is sort of getting into uh, artillery 101, and I'm certainly no expert, and I will not um, try to uh, explain that I am, but, I, but it, it's, it helped me to break it down. I mean, look at, look at uh, what happens you know, when preparing uh, this kind of an operation. Um, a proper military commander will identify military positions. Um, set out the conditions for achieving uh, the, obje the strategic objectives, assess uh, the potential tar targets and execute them in accordance with international humanitarian law. And this is all very important because it's exactly what the Croatian army did. Um, the, uh, Luka Mishetic went into extreme uh, detail with several witnesses, whether they were um, non-Croatian witnesses, whether, whether they were, um, uh, the, you know, the, the, the Serbian command uh, witnesses, some of them that, that, that came to testify. It, it was proven that only places and objects that qualified as lawful military objectives were attacked in Operation Storm. I think, Anna, if you look at the, 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 next, the next slide of, uh, in 31, I mean, this is the key to the appeal, this slide, really. Um, this is, and the yeah, this was it. And um, I, I think it was it was this. Um, and actually, uh, Tom, bear in mind, keep in mind uh, at the end when we're answering questions, there's going to be a question on this. And I think we can answer it uh, quite easily just in explaining it um, in this and the next uh, one or two slides. Uh, the 200-meter the radius uh, was... Um, basically concocted by the trial chamber. 
Um, so what it is, like if you look at, at the green text here, the trial chamber decided that projectiles that, in, that landed impact within 200 meters of an identified target, they were okay. But anything that hit beyond these 200 meters weren't just considered to be off target, you know, uh, severely, they were considered by the trial chamber to be unlawful attacks on civilians. Um, this reasoning was considered unreasonable. Um, the, the appeals chamber found that the 200 meter rule was baseless, especially since there was nothing on the trial record. There was no support, there was no testimony, there was no exhibit. Uh, no expert report um, had, had, had mentioned this, that, that a 200 meter standard existed. Um, and this was alarming. Uh, and of course, um, uh, General Gotovina's, uh, our team uh, appealed this and, and made the argument that it's, it's essentially impossible to expect commanders to adhere to such a rule. Uh, the closest standard that did appear on trial uh, was through the testimony of Canadian Andrew Leslie, and he stated that a 400 meter radius was an acceptable standard. Um, so if, if, if we look at how, how the trial chamber considered all of this, um, their finding of, a, of unlawful artil artillery attacks uh, was mostly based on the trial chamber's uh, analysis of the sites of the four towns. Uh, of course, it's no surprise that uh, their impact analysis uh, resulted in uh, the conclusion that uh, our unlawful artillery attacks occurred and that these unlawful artillery attacks were the cause of the deportation of Serbs from the Kraina. Um, the appeals chamber, however, when it uh, examined all of this, uh, concluded that uh, the impact analysis could not be uh, could not be could not be considered uh, taken into consideration. The 200 meter standard was serious uh, enough that the conclusions of the analyses could not be sustained. So, to uh, apply criminality. Uh, to um, the, the, the allegations of unlawful uh, artillery attacks. If you look at uh, the commander's state of mind at the time he ordered the attacks. So the trial chamber tried to state that in the Gotovina's statements at Brioni were proof that he had um, the state of mind prior to the attacks taking place that he knew what he was going to do with the ultimate intention of driving out uh, the Serbian population. Interestingly enough, the appeals chamber determined that the trial chamber only made inferences from what General Gotovina said at the Brioni meeting. And um, they said that the trial chambers, uh, the trial chamber would take those inferences along with its own finding of unlawful artillery attacks. And by combining those two, uh, unfounded factors, they established the existence of a JCE. Um, the, the, there's a question that came in uh, regarding uh, the, uh, why, basically asking that the prosecution didn't argue the 200 meter rule in its in its indictment. And where did that come from? I think it was Brian Gallagher yeah, Brian who Gallagher. asked it, Brian. Um, Brian, no, it wasn't in the original indictment. Uh, this was um, reasoning that the trial chamber concocted themselves, and and um, it's it, it's it, it became evident uh, in the appeal phase that it it was thrown out. It was found baseless. Back to principles of international humanitarian law. Um, you have to consider, again, if you're going to uh, find criminality in, in uh, the operation, you ask whether acts of violence were willfully directed against the civilian population. Um, quite easily, the appeals chamber found that since there was no finding of, a, of unlawful artillery attacks, then no allegation of crimes or deportation or transfer uh, could be sustained because nothing illegal happened to make the civilians leave. 
Tom, think, go uh, ahead and, and talk about, um, go ahead. Oh, sure. I think um, we can look at, we can actually uh, just briefly look at slide 36. Uh, we've talked about some of this already, um, but I think the, the more key uh, factual issue on the appeal, which the appeal chamber, which we stressed all as defendants uh, or accused uh, is in 37. Um, you have, essentially, we didn't even talk about the four towns that were su supposedly unlawfully shelled other than Kanin. It was Grachatz, Kanin, Benkovats, and Obrovats. Now, out of those four, Grachatz was one of the main points of uh, military objectives of the Spezialzi, the special police. And of course, there was artillery fire used there. And I didn't include it in this, um, in this particular uh, um, PowerPoint, but we had direct testimony of prosecution witnesses. They called two Spezialzi uh, artillery guys as, as prosecution witnesses. They were subpoenaed to come for the prosecution. Um, Josip Turkai and uh, Zdravko Janic. And both of those guys said, we did not target civilian targets, only targets were military targets. So that was in the prosecution's case in chief. And they still found mm -hmm. um, that, that at least as the Grachats, it was there were civilians targeted. Now, if you look at this slide, slide 37, uh, I mean, 95% of its artillery rounds were legitimate military objectives, 95%. Now this is artillery, it's not laser guided, like we have now, or even, you know, I don't think that there were probably some that were militaries in the world back in 95 that had that, but you know, these were not modern heavy duty, you know, laser guided or uh, computer guided munitions. These were regular artillery, uh, you know. And, and Tom, you know? this, this, this 95% accuracy, that's, that's the trial chamber found this with taking the 200 meter rule in the, the right. standard into consideration, right? That's based on the 200 meter right. standard. Exactly. And and there were no civilians. There was not a single ev a shred of evidence that any civilian, there was a, a civilian victim of shelling. Not one. Yeah. Um, nor was there any evidence, and I think Luca focused on this, of any civilian ever testifying at trial. Hey, I left Kraina because of the shelling. Not a single one. So... If you look at the next slide, 38, um, it's the trial mark chamber convicted the two generals because it found that the remaining 5% of artillery, now this is 1,200 rounds of artillery here, folks. This is not like Bukovar that was, and Sarajevo, which were mercilessly shelled on a, on a daily basis. 65 yeah. out of 1,200 rounds fell too far than more 200 meters from a known military objective, and that was illegal and uh, um, unlawful use of artillery. And then the trial chamber uh, further- According uh, to the trial chamber. <laughs> right, right. And that's primary and direct cause of the departure of Serb civilians, even though they couldn't identify one civilian that was killed by artillery or who claimed mm -hmm. to have left Croatia out of fear of shelling. So, and then a further absurdity when you look at this is that other than the four towns, Karachats, Benkovac, Obrovac, and Kanin, the trial chamber specifically found no Serb civilians left for reasons um, unrelated to un, uh, unlawful conduct. So it means that everybody else in the Karina, so-called, uh, didn't leave because of shelling, which is, when you look at that from, from a perspective of logic, just logic, it makes absolutely no sense. But fortunately, we were able to use even the things that the trial chamber found in our favor to absolve our clients on appeal. Yeah. Um, let's, let's move on to 39. This is another uh, piece of evidence here at trial. Uh, the UN a daily sit rep situation report. This is on August 4th of 95. This is the UN documenting this and sending it to UN headquarters. And what was interesting is, if you look at the highlights, um, it says the capital of RSK Kanin was heavily shelled and damaged. 
two shells impacted sector south headquarters, which was unfortunate. I mean, those sector south headquarters is the UN. Um, it says Croatia, Croatia succeeded in their thrust from the general area eastern part of the Velibit Mountains, uh, where special police units cut off the main road. We'll just wait for Tom to come back. It's okay. Here he is. Hey, I'm back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no problem. Um, if we go to the next page. And so this is the kind of background some of the prosecution witnesses had. If you look at this report, um, this was another piece of evidence, which we unfortunately did not have when General Leslie testified as uh, Greg and Luca made mincemeat of him in cross-examination, but this would have put the nail in the coffin, I think. This is a transcript of a Canadian radio program called As It Happens. And they're asking both General Leslie and General Ferran about Operation Storm. And uh, here's General Ferran testifying. Uh, there were hundreds of Unfortunately, we have a bit of uh, trouble again with Tom. I think he'll be he'll be back in a sec. We'll just give him a second until he comes back. But this this radio report actually. It, it came uh, into evidence during uh, when uh, Alan Ferrand was testifying. Uh, Andrew Leslie had already finished his testimony. When we, uh, it, was, uh, it was Tom's team actually that, that put this uh, radio report into evidence. And, and I remember well when uh, Judge Ori heard uh, the, the I, I think we had it. I think we had it in audio. I can't remember if we just had it like this in, in a written transcript. Uh, Judge Ori's eyes opened wide. He could not believe um, that uh, the inaccuracy of, of, of this kind of a report. Um, you know, General Friend uh, was asked, uh, you and your UN troops, the Canadian troops, you're right in the middle of, it, of all this. And, and he responded, yes, unfortunately, you know, for the last hour, it's been fairly quiet. No explosions in the town of Keene, but today I think there must have landed more, somewhere around 700 to 800 shells throughout the, the cities. And also on the Canadian side, because they are a small contingent here, and one is, and one is the Canadian one. I, I mean, the, the, the unreality of, of this report was, was shocking. Um, if we go to the next page, sorry, I just have to zoom in here. So evacuating, uh, he's asked, uh, uh, he's saying that there, uh, there is discussion of evacuation of all the civilian population in Sector South. And he's asked by the journalist, will you be in charge of that? And he says, well, first, I can't decide that, you know. It has to be that the UN agrees to that particular withdrawal plan because we're talking about the evacuation of all the civilian population in my sector, which is around, you know, from 32,000 to 40,000 people. And he's asked, do you know whether there are civilian casualties? And if there are, what can you do? So further down the highlight, he says there is. And as I mentioned, there is a lot of that. There is a lot of area that unfortunately we were not allowed by the Serbs to go to for military reasons. And we know that there have been some wounded and some dead, but it's difficult to assess the number presently. 
the question is further asked, it's difficult to tell just what the international community's position is. Where do you think we are now? And Ferrand responds, well, I think, you know, militarily, I would say that the Serbs are really weakened presently. Even so, they have shown extreme restraint. They have not used their artillery to fire on civilian cities, which the Croatians, which the Croats did. Uh, the Croats, you know, bombarded all the Knin, the capital here, and all the small cities and towns around the edge of the zone of separation. Well, um, I, I think all of this information was was put into the proper context, clarified, and and uh, I, I know that uh, Ferrand himself was uncomfortable when he was in uh, being examined uh, during trial. Um, let's let's go to there's another report. I'll let Tom talk about sounds like Canada. We have um, a report of a Croatian army uh, chief that was grilled at the war crimes trial. This is uh, coverage. We, we, somehow we, we, we can't seem to find the video anymore of the, uh, a CTV report of Andrew Leslie, but we do have uh, this CBC article. Oh, Tom, you're back. Hey, you know, you it was the Canadians, me? they wanted to take me off the air. It worked. <laughs> I'm <laughs> kidding. Listen, I just talked yeah. about Ferrand's, uh, the, the transcript of Ferrand and on, on CBC. Um, do, you want to, do you want to talk about uh, Andrew Leslie, the CBC article here? I don't know if we just lost Tom because of his camera crashing or because he was, did, did you just freeze because you remembered Andrew Leslie on the stand? Yeah, I had, you know, that, that guy was such a piece of work. Um, I, <laughs> Tom, it's, to, it's stop your, to stop your, um, do you want to turn off your camera maybe and just, and just be on audio and that might uh, prevent you from yeah. crashing? I'll, I'll do that. Um, and you know what I'm going to try to do is um, I'll try to call in through my phone. But as long as I'm here, well, let's just keep Anyways, going. Anyways, okay, I'll, let's I'll continue like this for now. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. So uh, do you want to... Uh, I'll talk about this portion. Gonna... Yeah, you go ahead. I mean, uh, let's talk okay. about uh, Leslie. You go ahead. Okay. Uh, General Leslie... General Leslie, uh, this article uh, does a great job, obviously, of, of uh, talk. Okay, we'll have Tom back in a second. Um, when uh, Andrew Leslie testified, we, uh, we managed to get uh, a reporter from CTV to, to come, the London correspondent, he came to The Hague and, uh, and did a great report on the outcome of Andrew Leslie's uh, testimony. And, um, and there was uh, the, the full Lloyd Robertson clip uh, on the CTV news uh, later that day. And uh, yeah, I really regret that uh, I didn't uh, take a copy of that of that report from YouTube, because um, uh, it's a keeper. But obviously, um, it was it was decided that uh, by some higher ups in Canada that the video should be removed from the internet. And uh, but we have this CBC article here. Um, sorry for 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 the delay. I'm going to scroll down. So if you look at the second paragraph from the bottom, in news reports from 1995, Leslie insisted that Croat forces were targeting civilians in the town, actions that would constitute a war crime. On the stand, Leslie acknowledged that he did not personally witness such attacks. As lawyers noted, UN investigators found no evidence of attacks. Uh, 
uh, I recall well uh, that, 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 of course, there was an effort to discredit uh, Andrew Leslie's uh, testimony and his accuracy. And the lawyers uh, called into question the Meritorious Service Medal that Andrew Leslie had received in 2004 after numerous years of service. The Oh, okay. Hey, Tom. Hey, Mate. Let me just call in Mate and I'll just do it this way through your phone. Okay, you're on speaker right now. So. You're on speaker, so... Um, Hi, here's here's Tom. I have it, but it just keeps coming. Okay, okay, that's okay. We'll make it work. Uh, sorry, everyone, but I, I hope this is gripping enough for you all to yeah. hold on and listen to this. Uh, Tom, I'm just talking about um, the Leslie article and um, when he received the meritorious me uh, service medal. Do you want to uh, take it from there? Sure. Yeah, it, it's. That in particular is unbelievable. Uh, he received the Meritorious Service Medal supposedly for saving people, civilians, from shelling during in Canadian. And, and it ended up being that Luca and the determinant team found out that, that he did no such thing. And they told the prosecutor, look, we're using this. And the, because we you have to put these things, a lot of the documents in advance before the witness testifies. Yeah. And the prosecution that was begging him not not to use that please don't so get embarrassed i'm like what are you talking about this guy's claiming that we're that that general Beethoven is like intentionally killing civilians with shelling and you you're worried about this guy being embarrassed that he did that he actually didn't get deserve the medal that he that he got and uh he was he was thoroughly discouraged during the course of his testimony not only that but he was up to be like the chief of the uh, croatian or croatian guy. canadian uh, Canadian military, and um, yeah, and he ended up not getting that uh, that position specifically because of what happened uh, at this at the testimony uh, in the Hague. So um, he did not rescue forty people uh, in leading the rescue. He was he was hiding in the uh, Canadian uh, um, uh, UN uh, sector South headquarters. When in fact there was some other guy whose name I wish I could remember who was the guy that actually went out in APC to get uh, UN uh, workers who were in Canaan back to the secure area of the um, United Nations headquarters in Canaan, and that guy was really the guy who deserved any accolades. If absolutely, um, but of course he never got anything. Absolutely. Uh, and, and uh, so, I mean, General, Gen, mm -hmm. General Leslie was not, go ahead, honest. No, 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 I was, I was going to say, um, when, uh, no, when, oh, there's, there's a bit of an echo here, hold on. Oh, maybe, maybe Tom just turned it off on your side. Yeah, you turned it off? Okay. Yeah, you can turn it off, yeah. Hey Tom, um, what uh, Leslie yes. uh, Leslie had uh, Andrew Leslie had that uh, radio interview. Was that uh, sounds like Canada? Is that is that what that interview is? Yeah, that was in Canada. So right, it's it's a few it's a few slides earlier up. Well, we don't need to go into it in great detail, but but that's the interview where uh, where Leslie said that there were tens of thousands. Of civilians dead in the streets of Canaan. Is that correct? Yes. I mean, he said that we don't know how many uh, civilians they killed. It says uh, the question, and I'll read it because it's worth reading. Okay. Uh, the first war crime was actually the sh is, was actually the shelling itself, and, and he said, uh, he, Leslie says, "quote I'm a gunner. I'm an artillery officer, a professional." so I can comment on it with some degree of validity. This was deliberate targeting on a massive scale of residential areas. Why? Because I believe it was targeted to break their will to resist. And by the way, it worked. It killed a lot of civilians and we'll never know the exact number, but estimates range from 10 to 25,000 dead. Right. That's what he actually said. Right. 
Whereas in fact, uh, let's fast forward, solution. let's fast forward to a gazillion exhibits and testimony and court hours. So how many people actually were killed as a result of storm? Nula. Nula. That means zero. zero. Exactly. Exactly. And and it's yeah. it's it's maddening uh, when you realize that statements such as Andrew Leslie's. I mean, I, I think I'm very sure the prosecution thought that he was going to be one of their star witnesses. Um, you know, comments such as Leslie's, and then you look at uh, I mentioned Carl Bilt earlier. Uh, misleading, hor horrid, uh, horridly misleading statements by by uh, people like that, and yet, you know, researchers and and analysts in the prosecutor's office gripped onto this misinformation, and and tailored indictments that would satisfy Carla's uh, Carla's ultimate plan, Carla Del Ponte's ultimate plan, and and it it, it is it's it's maddening. Sorry, Tom, I'll let you, I'll let you carry on. I got on a tangent. No, no, that, you're exactly right. I mean, it was very frustrating to us as, uh, it was very frustrating as its defense lawyers because what, what happened with this transcript of General Leslie was we didn't get it until after he had already testified and we didn't have the opportunity to confront him with it. Right. Uh, so we confronted General <laughs> right. Because uh, he came after General Leslie. And it was like the judges didn't seem to care. Um, no, but do you remember? Were, do you remember there was uh, a, when you guys brought marching. forward, uh, when you guys brought to, as it happens uh, uh, to um, in, in the courtroom? Um, hmm? No, no. I was going to say that um, I remember when you guys brought the "as it happens" uh, article into court, and uh, Leslie had already testified. Judge Ori's eyes, his expression um, was profound. He he was shocked. Uh, and and is am I right? Do I remember uh, correctly? He and he said, "Why didn't you bring this when yeah. when Andrew Leslie was here?" Yeah. And I still remember my response. I said, I wish we had it then, Judge, believe me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes, yes, but we, yes. We just didn't have it, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, so enough, enough on the uh, illustrious uh, well, let's, let's go to the next. good soldier and, and go onwards. Yeah. So yeah. go ahead and I'll, I'll let you. Uh, the, the appeal. Uh, sure, sure. Anna, thank you. And I'm sorry for the for the technological issues, everybody, uh, on there on my end. Um, the trial chamber, if you look at 51, uh, the trial chamber didn't find General Skotovin or Markets liable under superior authority or command responsibility. This was actually a huge thing for us because if they would have, they could have found us guilty on both. Yeah. And had they found us guilty on command responsibility, that would have been much more difficult to win on appeal, even though I thought we had the we had great facts. So the fact that they did not find General Skotovin or Marka guilty on command responsibility was extremely helpful in the appeal. Despite that fact, and despite the fact that the prosecution in, in, in The Hague, the prosecution can appeal if they lose an issue. Despite the fact that the prosecution did, did not appeal that, uh, f that finding of no superior or command responsibility. The trial chamber did not make a decision one way or the other. They thought, okay, we got this JCE decision. They're convicted. We don't need to decide anything on superior responsibility. We were happy with that. Yeah. But the prosecution, had they not been or not agreed with that, should have appealed it. They did not appeal it. Right. However, during the course of oral argument, they were allowed to make that appeal. But the appeals chamber to us shockingly allowed them to, in the middle of the arguments, make an appeal as to uh, command responsibility, even though they didn't timely do it uh, after the trial judgment. So that was a very uh, troubling issue for us as defense lawyers, because all the appeals briefs that had been written hadn't dealt with any of that issue at all. And then all of a sudden they started making uh, arguments about command responsibility 
and all of us on the defense side were going, wait a minute, wait a minute, you never appealed this. How can this be right. uh, even discussed? Well, the trial chamber, the appeals chamber allowed it to happen. Um, so that, uh, if we go to uh, uh, trial 50 uh, or transcript or uh, transcript, slide. getting too used to the trial here, um, the slide 52. Uh, Anna, go ahead. You, you did a, this is the PRISM slide. Um, yeah, I, it's funny, it's been uh, several years since the appeals uh, chamber judgment, and uh, I started uh, to go through it again with a fine tooth comb just to, to um, recollect a lot of things. And uh, so, if, if we're, I know that I'm kind of stepping back into like the, the middle of our, of our uh, webinar now, but so let's look at. The question, did General Gotovina actually order an unlawful attack? Um, so the, 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 the order is, was a document uh, that, 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 we, uh, that actually the prosecution tendered into evidence, the P1125. It was uh, uh, General Gotovina's order of August the 2nd. Uh, I, I don't have a visual of it here. I should have, but I think well, I will provide it uh, for... Um, It'll be uploaded later with uh, with this presentation for whoever wants to view it. Um, the prosecution was fixated on this, and and they stated that uh, Gotovina ordered an unlawful attack on the entire towns, not just you know um, specific targets, but on the entire towns of Knin, Obrovac, Gracets, Benkovac, and Dirvar. And 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 that and that their intention was just to quite easily shell the towns indiscriminately. Um, Gotovina, our, our defense argued that the attacks were meant against military targets only. And after a lot of time and effort, and several months, if not a couple of years later, the appeals chamber agreed, saying that Gotovina's order did not explicitly call for unlawful attack on the four towns. Now, this last paragraph in front of us, I found this um, this raised more than an eyebrow. This like, I, I, I was, um, I, I found this line interesting. Uh, the appeals chamber went on to state that the trial chamber made conclusions of unlawful artillery attacks by viewing other evidence on record through the prism of their impact analysis. Uh, if you recall, when I, when I was speaking earlier, the trial chamber did impact analyses of all of the targets that were hit and then made the 200 meter rule, et cetera. So basically the trial chamber had gone and uh, made their own evidence as they went along. They, 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 they no, well, no, that's not a good way of putting it. It wasn't their own evidence. They made their own conclusions, but based through the, you know, looking through the prism of their impact analyses. And um, it's almost like you're, you're, you're looking at through a specific lens that only lets you see what you want to see. And that was, and that was telling, like when you have the appeals chamber telling you this, it was gratifying on our part. It's yes, that's what, that's what our, 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 our team was arguing. Uh, the entire time, and and it was very gratifying, and uh, and I was very grateful to read uh, language like this because um, it, it's true. It just completely uh, swept uh, away any any um, any legs. I mean, the legs under under uh, judge. Well, the trial chamber's decision just got knocked right out. Um, but Tom, I'll go to the next slide now. Um, go ahead. What's the number? I'm sorry. Oh, well, we're talking uh, about the outcome of the appeals decision. So we're, we're at, we're at uh, 53. Okay, got it. Thank you. Uh, the appeals decision, uh, obviously, a win is a win, whether you win in 10 to nothing or three to two. Um, we were happy, yeah. overjoyed for our clients, especially. Yeah. Um, no, no joint criminal enterprise, and that was that was the key. Um, as as uh, Anna said earlier, one of the criticisms of, of the judgment 
is that the appeal uh, cham appeals chamber didn't consider the quote totality of the evidence end quote, but focused too narrowly on the 200 meter standard. Uh, well, that's the next slide 54. Uh, if you look at slide 55, uh, um, the totality of the evidence is clear because it was there was no JCE. I mean, this was a complete scandal uh, to have convicted them on JCE based on the whole artillery uh, debacle. Mm -hmm. Now, had they tried to figure out some other way to convict Latovina and Markaj, it would have been more difficult, I think, to uh, to win on appeal given how uh, they frame the issues. But for us, framing the issue was the most important thing. Right. If you as a defense uh, uh, team frame the appeals issues the way we did and focused on this whole issue of artillery, which is what the trial chamber did, there was no other way mm -hmm. to have a result other than what we did on appeal. Now, let's look at what the uh, all of the judges, the prosecution, the defense, and the trial chamber, and the whole appeals chamber unanimously all agreed on what the totality of the evidence was. So if you look at, for example, uh, if you go to slide 57, mm -hmm. okay, this is, everybody agreed, not a single civilian victim of shelling, not a scrap of evidence to identify any civilian who was killed or even injured by shelling mm -hmm. anywhere. Go to number 58, slide 58. They could not produce evidence of any single Serbian civilian who have claimed to have fled Croatia during the shelling. So the trial chamber says, well, 20,000 Serb civilians fled from Kim, Bankovac, Ogorovac, and Gracias due to fear of shelling. Where, who are these people? They never identified them. Um, that was huge. Mm -hmm. uh, a huge glaring error, not only by the prosecution, but by the trial chamber. This is even, I think, even more reflective of how absurd the trial chamber judgment was. Yeah. And the United Nations itself conducted a limited investigation into the shelling of Kanin right after Operation Storm. And that was on August 18th of 95. Uh, and they had a report, you'll see it uh, in the next slide. It said it was, uh, the UN concluded that shelling was concentrated against military objectives and that only few impacts, three to five, is observed in other urban areas. That's the ubiquitous uh, it, it, P-64. Now, we had a defense version of this, too. I think we, we used it and marked it. But P-64 was this yeah. report. Yeah. And P-64, as you can see, um, is a UN document, confidential. Um, this is also was a little, also a little troubling. It said, and, um, I think it's on the second page. Here's yep. uh, uh, first page, I'm sorry. Uh, okay. Point number two, in general, Shellen was concentrated against military objectives. Um, and then if you look at the second page. Of, sorry, uh, I'm jumping all over. <laughs> okay. My, my problem, I'm sorry, which is slide 61. Um, it says, number six, this assessment is based on a brief survey. It gives only a rough estimate of the damage. And then what's puzzling to me, it says, Paragraph two is considered sensitive and must not be released to the media at the present stage. This information should therefore be kept confidential for your internal use only. Now, what in the heck? I mean, if the initial assessment of, of artillery, which is August 18th, now this is a week, more than a week after Operation Storm, yeah. and you come to the conclusion more than a week after Operation Storm that the, the military objectives were, were where the artillery landed, why is it supposed to be such a secret? Yeah. And if you want to talk about conspiracy theories, there's one right there that's yeah. that's given to you in black and white. Um, and fortunately, we have this document. And I have no idea who or what uh, made this uh, report to be confidential at the time. Uh, maybe it's because they were trying to uh, put pressure on Croatia to, to stop its military activity going into Bosnia, which is where General Batovina was. Um, and I, I don't. I still don't understand that. But that was that was one of the puzzling things about this case that we never found an answer to was why it was considered to be so secret. Um, yet it was very exculpatory for Croatian the Croatian military. 
Um, if you look at the next slide, I'm sorry, uh, number 62, which is the appeals chamber, uh, it says appeals judgment. Both the trials and appeals chamber, they agreed unanimously that in every other part of sectors north and south, I always put Kraina in quotes, and I try to use sectors north and south because the Kraina to me was a fictitious entity. Um, all of those areas, ex except Kanin, Bankovats, Obrovats, and Grachats, they left for the their own reasons, unrelated to any alleged unlawful conduct. So these reasons included, and I'll go to the next slide, the evacuation order. Luca did a great job, and Greg, of uh, talking about how the Serbs had practiced the evacuation yeah. in case of an attack, and they actually issued an evacuation order for their population, civilian and military, to vacate the crime. So this was the, one of the other reasons that the trial chamber and appeals chamber uh, uh, felt that the Croatian forces uh, did not, that the Serbs left unrelated to any unlawful conduct, the evacuation order. Oh, that, that evacuation uh, order, actually, uh, I was going to say it's the 25th anniversary today of the evacuation order. Right. It was August the 4th. Yeah. Um, yep. And the other issue is fear of violence commonly associated with armed conflict. So, you know, all the propaganda that the Serbs were saying, look, you can't stay. They're going to, you know, we're going to have a Srebrenica here and, and uh, Kameen, you have to leave. If, so, you know, fear breeds fear. It's it's like people are, are leaving and they start leaving because uh, everybody else is saying, you got to get out of here. So fear of violence commonly associated with armed conflict, that's another reason why they left. The last reason, which is uh, plausible and general fears of Croatian forces and a distrust of Croatian authorities. Now, for I don't know how many years, yeah, their population was being told that you know you're going to have another Srebrenica that uh, you know you have you can, if you don't leave they're going to kill every single one of you. I mean that was the propaganda that was being fed to them. So those issues the the trial court found and the appeals court they were they were unanimously uh, in agreement that those were reasons why people would leave and that they were not illegal reasons for them to leave. I'm sure Luke is going to talk a lot about that in his webinar about yes. mm -hmm. how this was not, quote, ethnic cleansing, end quote. Um, if we go over the next slide with the two dissenters, Judge Bokar and Judge Agius, um, even though there were no victims of shelling in the four major towns that were uh, the trial chamber thought were uh, shelling made people leave, the fact that there wasn't a Serb civilian ever identified as having left uh, those two judges said that there was no reasonable trial or fact that conclude any differently that these terms were spelled by a artillery fire, which is to, to me, based on the evidence, completely illogical. Mm -hmm. If you look at the next slide, 66, the acquittals. Um, uh, Polkar argued, uh, you know, you, you hate to say stuff about the Italian judge, but, you know, okay, yeah. Uh, you don't get to have split or the Croatian coast anymore, okay? That's just a long-lost Italian uh, greater Italy dream that's gone. Um, I'm just joking, of course. But Judge Bokar argued that even if the appeals chamber were to acquit Beethoven and Markac, it should have established that there was JCE involving P President Tuchman, Minister Shushak, and uh, General Shervenko. So that's the to the extent that wasn't really even a, much of a discussion in terms of, of trial. Um, and of course, we're supposed to be convicting people as individuals, not as uh, governments or entities. So Judge Pokara, for some reason, wanted to extend the JCTE, not just to the people who were on trial, but the people who were even there to defend themselves. And I, I, actually, I think that the Lastly, whole, the whole uh, JCE, I think that's why I, we need to have a separate webinar to explain the whole JCE concept. Um, I, I think that's why the prosecution actually brought the exactly. JCE concept in here was it was an opportunity to implicate um, Tujman, Shoshak, um, and, and Chervenko um, to sort of envelop them uh, as being complicit in crimes because uh, they had they were already deceased. But this way, it, it, you know, the effort was made by them to put on the record that they were guilty. 
Okay, so then if you're going to include Tuchman, why aren't you going to include uh, the guys from Second and North? Yeah, uh, exactly. The uh, steep all the that were up there. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, it just made it made no sense. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, I mean, obviously, the, the the other issue, if you look at at uh, slide sixty-seven, the fact that all five judges unanimously agreed that. Um, you know, there was an error in the 200 meter standard, even though the Bokar and Agius were dissenters, the 200 meter standard was an error because it wasn't linked to any evidence. I mean, that's pretty darn clear. Yeah, yeah. And then Judge Bokar further agreed, if you look at 68, the dissenter, that the 200 um, meter standard was an error of law because there were, was not a reasoned opinion based on that in violation of Article 23 of the yeah. tribunal statute. Um, so if we go to 69, um, here is the other scary thing. The trial chamber fails to provide a reasoned opinion on a key element of the offenses of persecution and deportation. The majority decided that it would consider de novo the remaining evidence in the record to determine whether conclusions of the impact analysis are still valid. So it's like, oh my gosh, they're doing a factual analysis on appeal, which you're not supposed to do. Exactly. I'm trying to create new facts. Um, fortunately, fortunately, um they also decided that because there was it was not a reasoned opinion on the 200 meter standard that um they concluded that it wasn't a reasonable try or a fact who could find guilt beyond reasonable doubt that generals gotovin and mark had lost unlawful artillery attacks against civilians and civilian objects thank god um and then if we look at slide 71 this is why the trial chamber's decision was so uh, troubling to most modern militaries in the world, because if you conclude, as the trial chamber did, that any round from any artillery piece that landed outside of 200 meters from a legitimate predetermined, predetermined military target was presumably indiscriminately aimed at civilians. That's crazy. Uh, the rule would have exposed to criminal prosecution untold numbers of combat military officers. Yeah who did no more than follow indirect fire doctrine that's been universally accepted for decades. And that's why the amicus group filed that amicus. Uh, uh, the, the 12 experts. Yes. Yeah. They said this is, yes. If we uh, move to the next slide, um, I don't necessarily know if we need to go ahead and click on these uh, Croatia reaction to decision. Maybe the return to Croatia, it's kind of cool. It's not very long. Because that, that'll give you the feeling. Um, that'll give you the feeling of what it was really like right. uh, when when people came back. So this so is so. So Tom, do you want to just explain? Um, so <clears throat> uh, generals uh, Gotovina and <coughs> excuse me, Markac were on uh, the presidential the the presidential jet from Rotterdam back to Zagreb and uh, all of the defense council were on board the plane. And this, this was the arrival in Zagreb, right? Tom? Okay, we'll, we'll play the video. Yeah, go ahead and play it. I can't play it from here, but yeah. let me know if it's playing and let me know what it's done because I'm on the phone now and not on Zoom. It's showing it, but it's stalling a little bit. We can skip that. Let's go ahead and skip that. We only have a few more slides to go. Um, oh, it's it's moving now. Can show you next. Oh, hold on, hold on. Okay. It is. Uh, there we go. The the plane has arrived. It touched down, and here's uh, Generals Gotovina and Marka exiting the plane and being greeted by. Uh, President or uh, Prime Minister Milanovic, members of the Croatian Parliament, the yeah, and here's sorry, it's not showing. Okay, 
Okay, I'll I'll uh, leave the video because apparently it's not showing on our screens so on 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 the presentation. Or we can go to the next slide. There's only a few more left, and there's just kind of photos of the various uh, things that, are, that went on during the course of the trial. But the next slide shows obviously all of us in the courtroom. Uh, yes. Ana, Luca in the front, and me between my two colleagues. Uh, of yes, uh, I thought it was fitting to uh, just provide a, a picture of uh, Milan Mirkšić who testified. I mean, you, who would think that that you know uh, someone, a, a person such as him, who was so evil and and and, and reckless uh, during the war, and yet you know uh, we barely brought him in to testify, and. It was interesting after after days of testimony he even said to Luca and, and I think it was Luca's Luca's mastery of, of examining witnesses it, it really was phenomenal to watch and and Mirchich himself you know he the testimony was was sound and a lot of material came forward that that helped prove our case and and, and the evacuation of, of the population and and he said at the end of his testimony uh, to Luca that he's grateful that uh, Mr. Mishatich had called him to testify because he felt that a weight had been lifted from his conscience. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's huge uh, that, that something like that could be said. Um, I'll go to the next slide. So at the bottom, we see Luca, we see Judge Ori, um, the various pictures from evidence uh, that, that we had uh, put in trial. This is a picture from Navnik. This is early on in the trial. Uh, when we uh, were, were in court. I think we were all pretty stoic and tense at the time. Um, yeah, Anna, if you go back to the previous slide, the, the, the picture at the bottom is of the evacuation. Or yes. The practice, they had actually practiced yes, evacuation. It's, it's this so one here I, that I'm sort of uh, circling. I'm, I'm trying to remember the, the name of the, the officer there. Was it Terzic or, te, or, or something? I can't remember now. It's okay. I'm just, my memory is playing with me. But yeah, that, that was an interview of, of how the uh, civilian population was practicing. They were rehearsing uh, upcoming evacuations. If you want to go to two slides down and uh, to the picture of us. Uh, that was after closing arguments in the trial phase. Yeah. We were all together. That yeah. was basically my defense team plus current uh, Miroslav Shaparovic, who's the current president of the Croatian Constitutional Court, is now uh, uh, was a member of our defense team early on. Right. Right. And uh, the building to the right was our our office, uh, which was kind of cool. And if you go to the next picture there's another picture of our office sort of what life was like in the Hague uh we and, and if you look at the slide on the right uh the picture of the right on number 77 there was no drinking going on there uh no, of after course a week not. of heavy week <laughs> of heavy trial um need to show you this is a really nice picture and I'm, I'm sad that luke is not in this picture goran with us um this was right after the acquittal yeah. And that's myself, Greg Kehoe, Vlada, Leonard Lich, our case manager, and and we added several lawyers as did uh, as did uh, the Gotobina team to their defense team. Uh, the guy on the right, his name is John Jones, and I have to give him a ton of credit because he really put, uh, gave us a shot in the arm in our defense team, and, and he he has since passed. Uh, but John Jones, what a what a great great man and, and a great lawyer, and a massive help to us uh, on the Marquez team. Absolutely, his disposition was fantastic. Uh, yeah. Uh, and then we got the next slide. It was this uh, Anchita after you guys? This uh, was uh, General Gotovina's first uh, first morning uh, as a free man after after being in detention for for seven years, and uh, he asked to meet with us uh, in the morning for breakfast. And 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 so this is probably one of the most uh, one of the cherished uh, photos and memories that I have. And uh, so it's. Uh, our, our defense attorneys, so Luka Mishatich, Greg Kehoe, and Ganel Metro. Um, it, it was, it was, it was. Yeah, uh, Ganel, great lawyer. 
Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Another Ganel, great, yeah. great addition to the team. Yeah, yeah, he was, um, I, I think Luca did a great job bringing uh, Ganel on board in the appeal uh, for, for, for during the appeal stage. He did a great job. Uh, Payam, Payam should have been, yeah, Payam Akavan should have been in this photo. Unfortunately, he had to leave Zagreb the night before, uh, but he was also with us. Uh, in uh, in Zagreb, but uh, he definitely uh, should have been in this photo, as should have Diana Yurichevich. I, I really regret that that she didn't uh, yep. she didn't come to Zagreb uh, after um, well, after the acquittal uh, was was proclaimed. But um, Diana Yurichevich worked uh, so incredibly hard on this case, and and I, I know that um, yeah, Luca will also agree, and and Greg. Like that 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 she was such a valued uh, member of our team. I'll I'll go to the next what yeah. picture now. Right. Yeah, if you go to the next slide, then that's that's uh, General Mark Dutch myself, and uh, at the time it was Miroslav uh, uh, I think he was just I don't think he was doing uh, was in, in any government function at the time. Um, but this was right before we got out of the plane to go to uh, from Rotterdam. Uh, to Zagreb. Uh, what an incredibly tremendous relieving feeling, uh, the sense of relief. I mean, there was joy, but there was also a sense of relief. Right. Um, yeah. And I had to mention one of the, one of the slides before, uh, David Galt, who was one of our uh, legal assistants on the team, he deserves some credit to a lot of credit to I didn't want to mean to exclude David or our Canadian. Uh, I'll just go back, and, um, and he's right over tennis. here. He's. I'm, I'm showing yes. him on the screen right now. He's. Uh, He's at, at the end of a table with lots of empty bottles, <laughs> which is not to yeah. not to at all to to suggest that he was a drinker because I think he was probably the healthiest person in the courtroom. Yes. Uh, now let's go to the last slide. The last, last but not least, uh, that was the plane waiting for us in Rotterdam. I snapped that picture on my phone. Yeah. Uh, well, it's basically welcome to free the welcome to freedom ramp for the generals. Um, and then, of course, uh, I think the picture on the right uh, might have been afterward, uh, the convergence of press. Uh, my uh, key, you, know, is, you can't see Greg, but he's got the, the black He's got the on. black fedora uh, on, yeah. 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 Really uh, Goran fair. is in there somewhere. I'm just, I'm just kind of standing in the background. Luca and Goran are doing most of the talking, so. Uh, I'm just kind of standing there going, wow, I can't believe this. Uh, uh, the, that, the, morning, that was, that was it. the morning of the acquittal, I think after we, we finally uh, came out of the building and, and you guys were speaking to the press and there was so much going on. Um, the, 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 you know, the, the logistics of getting um, generals Gotovin and Markac from the detention unit uh, to Rotterdam airport uh, the arrival of, of of the presidential jet from Zagreb, uh, getting getting we had to scurry. Um, it was it was sort of like like a baton being passed. Um, I, I I delivered uh, General Gotovina's passport to the detention unit, and then members of uh, Croatia's uh, diplomatic office was waiting there and and went in to to uh, to greet him. And you know. What an exercise, uh, so much happening in one morning. And, and then uh, considering where, where we were that night uh, in, um, up on Pantovchak in, 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 uh, at the president's office, it, it, it was quite, it, it, was, it, was, it was actually an incredible, incredible experience. Well, I think I know we've gone along. Uh... And we have, I'm sorry for all the technical difficulties, uh, which were mostly on my end. For some reason, I, I was, I had fine internet, but Zoom was cutting in and out. So um, I, I will leave it to Anna and Monte to deal or uh, uh, to deal with the question side. Uh, I, I'll participate, but I don't have any access to, to what they are. So okay. if there are any, we'd be happy to ask them if people are tired. I think we've <laughs> covered. We can shut it down. Too. Yeah, I think we covered uh, a lot of material. Uh, so I don't know. Uh, are there any questions, Mata? That uh, I think that we have like one or two hours. So. Is anyone left watching? <laughs> you know, they're, they're, they're definitely watching. They're, they're probably with big eyes open. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to. Here, I'm uh, gonna turn. Yeah, here, since we're so sophisticated. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to add that you know because of the de technical difficulties, we'll be putting the the PowerPoint out in an article, as well as we'll be writing an article about this uh, about this webinar. So anything that was missed in in translation between you know our technical difficulties and whatnot, we'll we'll just write it out for everybody that. You know, if you want to know every single little detail, we'll we'll definitely be writing an article about it, put, putting the PowerPoint out there, and uh, hopefully that'll fix a lot of the, the technical issues that we have. So I, I just wanted to thank Anna and I want to thank Tom for you know taking their time out, and uh, I'm really sorry, Tom, that we had all the technical issues, you know, and uh, you know hopefully we can meet up in in Zagreb or or even in Zadar where we are right now. Absolutely. I just wanted to add to, and I, I think all, I, I can speak freely for all of us that uh, you know we did as a group. Uh, it took a lot of people, not just us, but a lot of people, and that was sort of the second fight. But we have to give credit where credit is due, and that is to the Croatian leadership, to the generals, to the soldiers, uh, and their families who all sacrificed. Either those who have passed were killed in action. Uh, those people who had suffered have to suffer the trauma of, of PTSD after the action and their families, uh, they gave the ultimate sacrifice. And uh, we did this not just for our clients, which who were our primary, uh, which is our primary motivating factor as lawyers and, and members of the defense team is you represent your client to the utmost of your ability. But being all of us being Croatian, we had a special incentive uh, uh, to fight on behalf of Croatia and on behalf of those who lost their lives and sacrificed. Uh, we all we all feel that way and we, we are thankful and blessed to have had brave men and women and families who suffered immensely, both military and civilian. Uh, and thank God we have what we have today. Thank you. Exactly. 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 And, and and, and you're right, to, uh, Tom, in mentioning that there were so many people involved in this. You, you so rightfully um, included the most important people, the, um, the veterans, uh, uh, the people who were on the ground during Operation Storm. Uh, tomorrow is, 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 there, is our, our, our opportunity tomorrow to give thanks and to commemorate um, everything that they, that they did uh, in Operation Storm. And, um, and on it, it, it was an absolute honor um, that uh, that I was a I personally on my on a personal level that I was able to contribute to this case. Um, you know, I, I equate myself to anyone who's a Mash fan. I was Radar O'Reilly. You know, I uh, I I I, I, I try. <laughs> I was, I was, I, if, you know, I yeah. think if, if we had to dig and find something, I think, I think I was, um, you know, well, it, we found it, we, we found um, what we needed yeah. and, and I tried to keep the logistics, you know, the train running on time. Um, but so many people, um, just like your team, uh, Tom, we had so many people in Zagreb that, you know, I just happened to be the person in The Hague who was assisting Luca and Greg uh, in the courtroom, but so many people in our Zagreb office, I'm not even going to start naming names, but um, a huge, you know, we were in touch with them constantly when we were in court. And when we needed something, they delivered instantly, like within minutes, if we needed uh, backup documents or th yeah. they were so helpful, they, they were so helpful to us and, 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 and without them and without our cooperation between our teams, you know, uh, your team right. and ours, phenomenal. Um, and yes, I could, you know, sing accolades for another two hours, but I won't. So mm -hmm. I, I, I think it's time that we sign off, right, right Mate? Exactly. And, um, yes. Uh, I, I just echo so everything that everyone well, has said. Just, yeah, oh, leader saying goodbye, right? Exactly. Yes. yes. The sound of music. Dojenia. Zvogom. Tom, thank you so yeah. much. This was Bogi Hervati. This was very <laughs> satisfying to present this with you. I'm, I'm so grateful. Thank you. Thank you, and thanks for helping with the PowerPoint and everybody listening. We're sorry about the issues and technical stuff, but hey, it'll be on YouTube, right, Mate? Exactly. It'll be on YouTube, and we'll be writing a post on in Croatia Week. Awesome. Awesome. Take Bye care, there. everybody. All right. Bye there. Goodbye. Bye.